Hello everybody, I am Jarrett Rossagini Vlogger, and on today's vlog, I will be looking into Mr. Beat's colonial ancestors. Now in this episode, we're gonna quickly bring it forward in time again, back to that couple, Louis Arden Whitcomb and Mary Galtry, who we spoke about in episode four. But instead of tracing up the Galtry line, we're going to start tracing up the Whitcomb line. So here we have the family tree where Louis Whitcomb is the focal point of the tree. Now you can see that I've already built out a good amount, but our focus is going to be on the lineage tracing back, which I did focus on confirming. So as usual, the best place to start are the hints. So we're gonna go to the hints for Lewis Whitcomb. And we already saw that there is a photo and the photo is of the marriage license. So we're actually gonna click on that and take a look. And here we have the marriage license for Lewis Whitcomb in Jennings County, Indiana. Now Lewis's name is right here, but we notice it says Lewis Whitcomb and then there's a huge blank. And presumably this is where we should see Mary Galtry. We've already spent time looking into that Galtry family, so it's surprising not to see Mary Galtry listed. But I also noticed that this seems to be just a cropped image of a full digitized page. So the question then becomes, can we find that page? Because I also don't notice any signatures. Sometimes we will find the signatures of the couple. So could Mary be signing or even just making her mark? And then the other thing we can do is look at the other marriages around that time and see, do they also have the bride missing? Or is there maybe something a bit more nuanced that we're not quite getting? So I'm just exiting out of this and we're gonna look and see, do we have the marriage license through Ancestry? If we can find that marriage license through Ancestry and take a look at it, we can get that idea. Now, we do have information we see here, Indiana U.S. marriages, but this seems to just be an index. But you can see view record page for additional details, certificate purchase, suggested records, or to report an issue. So when we click that, it takes us to this page, and we can also click source to see a bit more of the source information. And if we notice, it says original data, Indiana marriages, 1810 to 2001, through family search from Salt Lake City. So let's jump over to Family Search to look further. So here at Family Search, this is the new search database for anyone who's used Family Search for years and you're looking at this, you may be a little confused. This was just recently rolled out, although I think there are some people that it might not have been fully rolled out to yet, but this will be the look of Family Search going forward. So all we're gonna do, we're gonna hit the more options so we can get the full list and we're going to put in Lewis Whitcomb. Now we know that the marriage was in 1839 in Jennings County, Indiana. So we can just put that as 1839 and I'm just gonna leave it as Indiana. That way it's a bit more broad. And in case it wasn't exactly recorded as Jennings County, Indiana, maybe it was recorded as something else, which does happen. So we hit search. And we see, all right, we have Lewis Whitcomb, marriage date, September 30th, 1839. That's matching up. And if we look here on this one, going over to the right, we have an image so we can see the actual page. So we're gonna put this down and now here we get the full thing. So we recognize the page here, here's Lewis Whitcomb's marriage, but we also see there are no signatures here. There's nothing seemingly here. And then down here, we have a different marriage and we do notice that both the bride and the groom are listed. So it's something that we should expect. But we also notice that under this, there's this state of Indiana, Jennings County, this to certify that I did on the second day of September 1839, joined together in a state of matrimony, the husband and wife, which looks like Cole Eastman and Elena M. Walton, given under my, and I'm not quite sure what it says there, um, November 9th, 1839. So we can look over and we see we have a whole nother one here, both of this county, October 17th, 1839, it's got that part underneath the main passage. And we see that here too, this is to certify. 
but that is not here. So what does this actually mean? And this is a very interesting thing to do when you find records. A lot of people probably would have seen that record on Ancestry, clicked on it and thought, oh, this is so cool, record of marriage from 1839, not really thought anything of it. But when you dive into it and look into it and you see the bride's missing, there is no certification underneath, which the other marriages all seem to have. So something is going on here. So did they actually get married on September 30th, 1839? Did something happen and they didn't get married? Another thing to note is that not only is Mary Galtry's name missing, but it looks like they left a space to write it in. Sometimes you will find records where there are issues with the actual documentation. Maybe the ink has leaked. Maybe it's not as legible. But with this, it doesn't look like anything was written. And we can even see the writing from the other side of the page just faintly. Especially noted that whoever wrote these wrote in a somewhat italic way. So everything is going from the bottom left to the top right, and we notice that this is slanted from the bottom right to the top left, indicating that it would be more of something from the other page than ink that has possibly disappeared or fainted or whatever for whatever reason, especially considering that the rest of the text has not. But we do have a whole bunch of other documents that do show that Lewis Whitcomb was married to Mary Galtry, but I think there's a question, at least for me at this point, when did Lewis and Mary actually get married? Were they ever actually married? And what is going on with that marriage certificate? So here we are back at that family tree, and we have here Jesse Whitcomb, who's the father of Lewis Whitcomb, and he was quite an interesting person. He was married to a woman named Sarah Peck, and they had a whole lot of kids, which scrolling down, we can see that there are a lot. And a lot of the information that I found on Jesse actually comes from a book that was written by one of his descendants. And we can actually see a page from that book, which was uploaded by a user who I actually was able to get in touch with. And she has sent me a whole lot of great materials. But first, we're going to look here at this page and we see Jesse Whitcomb. Now, the woman who wrote this book has since passed, but we can see her great, 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 grandfather's story. So Jesse and Sarah are her third great grandparents, but these are Mr. Beat's fifth great grandparents. And it tells us Jesse Whitcomb was the son of Israel Whitcomb, born March 13, 1733, married April 11, 1764, died May 11, 1811, and Mary Rowley. Jesse was born in Connecticut on April 8th, 1773. But the most interesting part to me is the story of Jesse in this. It says that Jesse took his family west sometime between 1804 and 1815, which is right before Mr. Beat's ancestor Lewis was born in 1816. Although based on the information I had, it seemed that Lewis Whitcomb was born in New York, so it's possible that that 1804 to 1815 range might have actually been more 1816 or it's possible that the birth we have for Lewis Whitcomb is incorrect itself. So there is a discrepancy there and this is something that we always need to deal with when doing genealogy and a big part of this comes from what's known as the genealogical proof standard and one of the things that's in that standard is that any sorts of contradictions need to have a clear resolution. And in reality, something we run into all the time are issues of contradictions where there may never be a true resolution. Although that's one of the reasons why DNA is so great because it can overcome a lot of these walls we face with the lack of documentation. But back to Jesse's story, they made their way to the Ohio River, floated on a raft down the river until they came to the mouth of the Wabash River. They pulled their way up the Wabash to Vincennes, where they lived in a big log cabin with a bark thatched roof. They had 14 children, which seems to match that huge list that we have, which I only have 13 children listed, but that could be explained by this sentence here. One child died at the age of two and one at 14 years of age. So is it possible that that child who died at the age of two isn't included in our list? So we'd have to look at all the children and see, do we have one who died at the age of two? It also mentions that Jesse was a shoemaker and a carpenter. Now, if we also notice 
This description says it's a page from They Came to Spencer Township, The Ancestors of Fay and Fielding Warrer, compiled by Alice War Yarnell. Now, I looked into this book, and I actually was able to get more information from C.J. Kotecki, who turned out to be the niece of Alice, and she even sent me a whole bunch of pages that had corrections from the original publication that Alice did. And this also means that C.J. is a cousin of Mr. Beat. In fact, she is Mr. Beat's fifth cousin once removed, and Alice is Mr. Beat's fourth cousin twice removed. Now, back to the tree... Here we have Jesse Whitcomb. Then we see he's the child of Reverend Israel Whitcomb and Mary Rowley, which we did see was confirmed through the book. Israel Whitcomb is the son of John Whitcomb and Metabill Dunham, which I hope I'm saying that name correctly. But then if we hit this, we'll be able to see some of the older branches as well. And we see that John Whitcomb is the son of Job Whitcomb and Hannah Loomis. And then Job Whitcomb is the son of Job Whitcomb and Mary Rowlandson. And Job Whitcomb is the son of John Whitcomb II and Francis Cogan. And when we click on John Whitcomb and go to his profile, we see that John was actually born in Taunton, England. So he was Mr. Beat's immigrant ancestor. But looking at the dates, we know that he had to have been a colonist. And something of interest for anyone who remembers back to episode three, John Whitcomb II and Francis Cogan are also the ancestors of President Calvin Coolidge. Although I should say an aside that I did not spend the time to confirm the line tracing from Calvin Coolidge to John Wickcomb and Francis Cogan. But I was able to reach out to some of my genealogy friends and I got in touch with David Lambert who found a lot of information. I'm David Allen Lambert. I'm the chief genealogist for the New England Historic Genealogical Society uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. Our website is AmericanAncestors.org. We're the oldest genealogical organization in America. If you're ever in Boston, Jared, you have to come in and see our library, but you can also visit it sort of virtually because we have a digital collection on our website. Our digital archives is amazing. And we have in the building a quarter of a million genealogy books. We have the Jewish Heritage Center, which is a great collection and collaboration that's part of our library now in Boston. So American Ancestors is brought to you by the New England Historic Genealogical Society. We have a 28 million manuscript Based collection and growing. Uh, we have fine art and an eight-story research facility, so you can physically come in as well as go to us online. It's very easy to go to. Uh, just go to AmericanAncestors.org and learn a little bit more about us. You can tell them David Allen Lambert sent you. <laughs> All right, John Whitcomb, a New England great migration immigrant. Now, one of the things that I always find it's um, tough with New England research here is that a lot of times people want to know the vessel their ancestor came over on. That's great. We don't always have passenger lists or in fact some of them aren't even passenger lists or called uh, records of embarkation. Someone has asked for permission to sail on a vessel. So it's not the type of passenger list you think about with Ellis Island coming into New York City. So we have some that have those. Then we have some we're not really sure where they came from in England other than they showed up at a port. And that makes it a little tough to try to figure out where they're from. Now, DNA has helped out a lot of that, but we're really lucky with John because about 25 years ago, a scholar unearthed some really good information about where he came from. So what we know is that John was born by 1598 and was the son of Thomas and Joanna Pope Whitcomb of Taunton, Somerset, England. And, and when he's about 25 years of age, he married at St. Mary Magdalene Church and that's in Taunton as well, to Francis Coggan. Now, they had a large group of children, and uh, that included uh, first one, Catherine, born about 1624, right through Mary, who was born in New England about 1647. And as you see there, there's two Jonathans. Well, the second Jonathan uh, equals into the time frame when uh, the family is now in New England. And that is a great nuclear family and typical of an early New England family that has uh, a couple of kids. <laughs> so on May 8th, 1635, John Whitcomb and his family set sail aboard the Hopewell from Weymouth, England, and they land in New England uh, and then settle 
in Dorchester in Massachusetts Bay Colony. Now, Dorchester is just south of Boston. In fact, is actually part of Greater Boston. Now it's uh, part of the city as a part of the whole infrastructure, which is like Dorchester, Roxbury, et cetera, which are the old settled towns, which are all now part of Greater Boston. John will stay in Dorchester for a little while. In fact, he gets 12 acres of land on Squantum Neck. And now this originally, of course, was uh, Massachusetts Indian land. And the Massachusetts uh, Indians, who I'm actually the tribal historian for, had their, um, I would say their summer um, village on not very far from Squantum in a place called Chickataw Hummock. So he would have known people that were the native people that lived very close by to where he lived in 1636 and got 12 acres of land. Now, by 1639, John and his family moved from Dorchester to Plymouth Colony in Situate, Massachusetts. And John obviously is one of those people who is a little fearful of the native population as they all were back then. You weren't really sure. And in 1637, actually, the Massachusetts and Connecticut settlers fought the Pequot War. So there were a lot of militia in early towns. And actually, John appears on a list of militia uh, in Situate, essentially men that were able to bear arms. In fact, uh, we find out later on in his last will and testament that he had his uh, military arms, which were valued at a total of one pound. By 1652, John was admitted as a freeman into Plymouth Colony on June the 3rd, 1652. That basically means he's free and clear of all debt that he wasn't uh, indebted to anyone for his indenture to come over. So he probably didn't have an indenture. He probably came over free and clear, as we would imagine, or at least by 1652. That also means he was a member of the church, and he could also serve on the jury, which happened later that year. In fact, so much so that he served on the jury and was also a constable in the town of Situate. So that means that he served warrants and brought people before magistrates. And so you could say that John may have been, in a way, a colonial police officer. By 1654, they now have settled in Lancaster, Massachusetts. So they've kind of hopscotched all around Massachusetts, going from Dorchester to Plymouth Colony, then out to Lancaster. John died in test date uh, on the 24th of September, 1662 in Lancaster, Massachusetts. And unfortunately, having uh, not left a will, we don't get a lot of the breakdown of his estate, but you still get to see the inventory. And his inventory was a pretty substantial amount. And, you know, not bad for a farmer at that point. Now, on October 2nd, 1662, we can find the value of his estate because an inventory was taken. That was just a little bit longer than a week later. And his entire estate was worth at 112 pounds. Now, we know that John was literate, not because he wrote a will, but he actually signed a deed where his name is then transposed on. So we have an idea that he actually could probably write and no doubt could probably read. So much so that his wife, who died nine years later, Frances wrote her own will on May the 12th, 1671, and it was proved March 23rd, 1671, 72. So the family itself is a really interesting uh, group in uh, New England because we know where they're from in England, which is something that's not always the case. A lot of people make speculation, but to know where a 16th century born immigrant uh, it was actually born based upon his parents and connections with a marriage in 1623. And I can tell you all this great information was vetted by the uh, amazing scholar, Robert Charles Anderson, who worked on the Great Migration series uh, for many, many years and still uh, is actively uh, a scholar. He's a fellow with the American Society of Genealogists and someone I've uh, been a basically mentor of for many, many years. So I can tell you that all of this is in good standing. This is published in The Great Migration Begins. And you find this series uh, was published back in 1995 when NEHGS was celebrating its sesquicentennial or 150th. And to get back into the 16th century, Mr. Beat, you're doing pretty well. But David also had found some great records through the AmericanAncestors.org database and showed how to find them on the database. Well, you know, one more thing I want to show Mr. Beat is that American Ancestors, we have digitized a lot of records over the years. And one of the things I thought he might want to see is the original records for the Wickdoms. So on American Ancestors, if I go to search and browse our databases, 
Now, the town he lived in ended up uh, changing over to Worcester County. But at this point in time, it's under the records of Middlesex County. So if I go to the Middlesex County probate files and I put in John Whitcomb, and then 1662 to 1662, and I hit search. Here's a four page probate record for him. Like I say, it wasn't a lot of documents. So I go to view. Let's do full screen here. And so there's the actual docket itself. And if I go to the next image, I'm gonna to have to pull out of this and do it this way. This is the actual detail on the court case of his probate being dying intestate. So all of these documents kind of give us a sense of the family, but there is Francis's Mark, his son John's Mark, his son Jonathan, Job, Josiah, his daughter Mary's mark and his daughter Abigail's mark, all making marks on this probate re regarding the settlement of their dad's estate, which I think is really great because we may not have portraits or paintings of individuals, but seeing their marks. So in this case, you basically have an FW for Francis Whitcomb and John, well, these squiggly lines are his mark. Um, he may have not been literate himself, uh, but some of the other children are. So you have Job and Josiah, and then the girls, um, Abigail, looks like she's making an A. It looks a little like an R, but um, it's some good documents to have in your family. kind of illustrates the past. Now we know that Francis, uh, soon after nine years later, left her own probate. And if we go back to that, now Francis Whitcomb, we know wrote a will and obviously it's been transcribed and we have the facts from it from the great migration book but sometimes these original documents get lost now this docket here is uh, something that you would expect to find in a folded up 17th century document it's from 1672 but the surprise that awaits you when you open it up is that it has these cards stating that the record of the will and the record of the inventory are recorded on volume three, page 396 and 397. Now, this is what happens when the uh, originals get lost. And this is why the checks and balances system of recording probates from the file papers into record books was so important. And it doesn't happen all the time where they're mis been mislaid, but this is a prime example. So on familysearch.org, you can find the record books for Middlesex uh, County, and you could go to volume three, page 396 and 97, and find those documents. In this case, we had John's, and somebody mislaid Francis's, but that's okay because we can find it a different way. But that wasn't all David had for me because he had found some quite interesting stories about John Whitcomb. So, so while you were looking into John Whitcomb, were you able to find any interesting stories about him? Yeah, actually, there were actually a couple. And it's amazing because you think of the 17th century, there's not a lot of stories, but court records are where you find the stories. So let me put my glasses on and see what I can tell you here. So this is, again, from the work of Robert Charles Anderson. On the 3rd of March, 1639-40, for so much as John Crocker of Situate is proved to have corrected his servant boy, Roger Glass, in a most extreme and barbarous manner, that the court upon due consideration hath taken said Roger Glass from said John Crocker and placed him with John Whitcomb of Situate to serve out his time with said John Whitcomb, which is six years from the 14th of June next. And said John Whitcomb paying the said John Crocker three pounds, deducting five shillings from his charges, and the said Crocker to deliver up the clothes to the said Whitcomb. Now, this is not enslavement. This is where someone has actually taken and is giving an apprenticeship to a child. Now, obviously, the other person wasn't treating him pretty well, and the court stepped in and made Whitcomb his new apprentice. So he learned his trade from John Whitcomb after, well, Crocker failed. <laughs> 
The interesting thing about Roger Glass, he is actually a nephew of Francis Coggan Whitcomb. So it was a family member. So it's kind of like taking in your nephew or niece. Now there's another story. Um, you can think John is very gracious and kind for doing this for his nephew. But on March 3rd, 1639 40, John Whitcomb complains against John Stowe, same date and same court, in an action for trespassing on upon the case and the damages of 30 pounds. The jury finds the, for the plaintiff five pounds damages and charge with the suit. Execution is for 14 shillings, six pence. And then in 1653, Ephraim Kenton complaineth against John Whitcomb in an action on the case to the damage of 30 shillings for non-payment of money as it appears upon the bill. The jury found the plaintiff for the bill and the charges of the court. So we have John being very generous and then forgetting to be generous and owing a bill and brought to court and then somebody trespassing on his land and getting a little money for that. So <laughs> he's a human with a story that might be no different than say yourself or your neighbor if you've ever had a uh, court case brought in. So I hope that little bit of color helps Mr. Beat realize that even our colonial ancestors had hot tempers and warm hearts. Now that's it for today's episode, but an interesting aside is that I get the feeling, in fact, I'm quite positive we'll be revisiting the Whitcomb family for one of our upcoming guests on a future season. But on the next episode, we're going to start looking into Mr. Beat's ancestors who came from Russia. Well, thank you so much for checking out this video. I do hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. It really does help me out. If you'd like to get access to my content early or even get access to exclusive content, be sure to become a patron of mine on Patreon. And not only will you get access to all this extra stuff, but you'll also be helping and supporting the channel. Thank you to my current patrons, Camilla Peterson, Jim Vavoda, Suzanne O'Connor, Tanny Summers, Megan House, Ryan Dale, Sergei Fizulianov, Stephanie Jones, Victor Rose, and Shelly Rogers. If you'd like to subscribe, you can click right about here. It is completely free to do so. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Genie Vlogger. I'm the Genie Vlogger. I'll see you in my next video.